Hi there, my name is David Miller and I'm a teaching pastor at Abernathy United Church in Abernathy, Texas. And we're starting our Revelation series this week. So if you're not able to join us, uh, we'll try to do this justice over the video, but this is more like a devotional than a message. So I hope you're able to come back and join us soon. But in the meantime, hopefully this will keep you updated if you're away from the body and um, or you're, you're ill, um, not, not traveling, but ill. I hope you will let us know if there's some need that we can meet for you. But in the meantime, we're going to start in Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 20, and encourage you to take the time to read that passage on your own. I'm not going to read it out loud today, but just a reminder that Revelation 1, 3 promises a blessing for people that um, read the book, hear the book, and do the words found therein. So I hope you and I will do all three of those. So I encourage you to read that. And as you do, um, and as we look at the Revelation, the book of Revelation, there's a few things I just want us to keep in mind as we start this series. One is that we um, really need to turn our attention to our unaided senses. And our, we're so often focused on the reality, things that we can see um, and smell and taste and touch, all the things with our senses. But the reality is there is an unseen reality, and that is the real reality, things that shape the things that we see um, and touch and hear. And in this book, we will find that there's a spiritual reality that shapes our physical world. And so we need to turn our attention to that as we start this journey. And the more we understand the unseen realities of life in the world and the universe, the more we will focus on the kingdom and his redemption for all of mankind and his power that has no end. So just a few things I want us to remember as we walk through this, and I'm going to cover this briefly, but these are really keys to unlocking the book of Revelation as we start it together. The first is that the Spirit of God teaches us. And so in order to understand a book like Revelation, we need to be asking the Spirit to teach us and be humble enough to ask God to illuminate his word for you and I. So as we dig into God's word, I'm just going to pray that over us and then we'll dig into some, some other things that are unseen realities and some keys to unlocking this beautiful book of Bible, the Bible called Revelation. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for anyone watching this video. I pray um, for them, as I pray for myself, that you would continue to unlock the mysteries of your word, um, that only your spirit teaches us the word that was inspired by the spirit himself and shines a light on the gospel and on Jesus. So God, I pray that you would help us through your spirit just to understand your word and to transform us to be more like your son, Jesus. Would you do that for us now? Would you do it in the name of your son, Jesus? We love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So as we dig in together um, today, whenever you're watching this video, seven keys that I want to invite you to uh, participate in in unlocking this book of Revelation, things to remember. One is that the book is a proclamation that Jesus has already overcome, that he's already defeated the enemy, that the end is written, that it is clear, and he wins. So regardless of what fear you have over the book of Revelation, I want you to know that if you're a follower of Christ, you're on the winning team. And if you're not a follower of Christ, then I hope and pray that the Spirit opens your eyes and ears to the gospel today and you move forward in a genuine and personal relationship with Christ. Secondly, no other book of the Bible, I believe, speaks such a contemporary word to modern day Christians as the book of Revelation. So we're not just studying end times and how the end will, will come about on the earth as we know it. But in addition, we'll look at what a healthy church looks like. And we'll also look about, at what transformation looks like. And finally, we'll have all types of words that we see and all types of learnings about spiritual warfare, prayer, and worship. So it really is it covers the full gamut of the gospel and transformation. So it's much more than just end times. And I pray that you see that through this study. Third, I want us to remember that we're not taught really anything new in the book of Revelation, that all of what we're going to learn is in the other 65 books of the Bible. 
And that really means that we need, ought to be better stu students of the Old Testament because we would know much of what's in the book of Revelation. But it really means that it's not new information, but a new way to say it. So I want you to think about this, that imagery has the power to evoke emotions and change in us that other books of the Bible written in different formats and, and different genres, if you will, and um, different literature components, um, literature conventions, if you will, don't quite do. And so this imagery that we find in the book of Revelation, I pray, rouses our emotions and imaginations, and I pray it rouses transformation in Christ. Um, a few other things to remember is that the book was written around 96 AD at a time of intense persecution. In 92 AD, we know that the Caesar had over 40,000 Christians killed. And not just that, but we have to remember that Paul and Peter and Timothy had been martyred by this time. And so we find John on the Isle of Patmos, 10 miles off what is modern day Turkey. And it's from there after he's been exiled and is there as a form of punishment uh, and the form of persecution that he has provided this vision. So in the book of Revelation, we see that Jesus is really speaking to the question of where is God when his people are in the midst of being persecuted? And he answers that question in this beautiful book. Where is he? What is he up to? And what will come of his followers? I pray like you and I. So remember that this book is not to us, but is for us. It is addressed to first century Christians who are in one of these seven churches who are suffering immense persecution. And so we should remember that it can't mean something entirely different to us than it meant to first century Christians. And certainly John is grasping to understand and describe things that he may not fully be able to describe or even understand what they are. So he's certainly grasping and may see things that first century Christians wouldn't have understood. But he does a beautiful job describing the, to the best that he can with the language that he has available all the beautiful things and all the imagery and all the, um, uh, not just that, but judgment that he sees. Um, and he does his best to describe those, which we benefit from even today, two millennia roughly later. So let's remember that it is for us, but the letter is not to us. Um, I also want to encourage us to ask the question of what type of literature in it, and I'll answer that in three ways. One it's a letter, and like, although it's the, one of the longest letters in the Bible, there's like many letters that are written from Paul to a audience of people. And it, it is written for specific needs. And this one meets the needs of those seven churches, but it also meets our needs of describing what we can expect in the coming days um, and what is going on with the unseen realities that influence the end times. Um, secondly, it is a prophecy. And a prophecy is not a prediction, but it is a declaration. And I want you and I to remember that a declaration of something yet to come requires a response from all those who read it. So you and I should be asking, what is our response to this beautiful book? What is our response to Christ through the power of his spirit? And then finally, it's an apocalypse, meaning an unveiling. And that means that this type of writing seeks to present the things that we know today in light of the unseen realities of the past, the present, and the future. The book really um, describes for us what will take place, but also the unseen realities and the spiritual warfare and the spiritual happenings around uh, what will um, occur and what is yet to come for all those living on this planet called Earth. Um, a couple of final notes before we dig into this first week. One is that the book of Revelation is presented in a series of windows which are called visions, things that John saw. So generally it is in chronological order, but there are exceptions. So it's important to remember that all, not all the visions are directly in chronological order. And we can put them in chronological order the best that we can based on other scriptures in the Bible. Remember, scripture interprets scripture. 
So when we're unclear about a passage or a chapter or verse, you and I should look to other chapters and verses in the Bible to understand them better. Finally, there are some unseen realities to keep in mind as we study the book of Revelation, this beautiful book. And um, three of these I want to leave with you, and then we'll jump into our text. One is that Scripture says throughout the book of Revelation that um, Christ is coming, not will come. That means he is actively moving towards us, that he brought the kingdom with him when he came for the first time in the form of a human. Um, When God came in the form of, of Jesus as he was born and then grew, um, lived a perfect life and then died on the cross and then rose again and ascended to the right hand of the Father, we know and we understand that that was him bringing the kingdom to the planet for the first time. So we live in this place where we are um, already followers of Christ, but we have not seen his full kingdom Come, meaning that there's still the depravity that we're living in. There's still the signs and symptoms of sin and disease and um, death. But we also know that he is moving towards us. He is not passively sitting on the throne. He is active in opening people's eyes to the gospel. He is bringing a degree of equity and justice to the world today. He is transforming people. He is an active um, Uh, God as he serves at the right hand of the Father, and he's he's doing that and acting through his Spirit, the Holy Spirit. So we can see in, among other places, in chapter 1, verse 7, in chapter 22, 7, 22, 12, 22, 20, he is actively moving towards us. He is actively in the process of returning, and his second coming is Um, in the process of occurring. And that's the reason why we see increased disease, the the planet um, with birth pangs crying out for his second return. Secondly, the time is near. While it's been two millennia, we see plenty of of signs that that his time of return is coming closer. We see more and more signs day by day um, that his time is near. And whether that's a hundred years from now or a week from now or an hour from now or a second from now, we will see his return because we see the signs um, that his end, meaning that his return and the rapture of his saints is coming soon. And so we should act accordingly. We should be looking forward to his return and seeking to proclaim the gospel to all those who would listen and be willing to be persecuted as we boldly proclaim the truth of the gospel. And then finally, we should remember, and maybe most importantly, we should remember that his I am statements bracket this beautiful book. And Jesus claims um, of being the I am bracket this book, and they provide an answer to the anguish of life, that he will have his way. All believers will become more like him and that everything begins and ends with him. So we see this in um, chapter one, verse eight, but also in chapter 22, verse six, that Jesus explains that he is all things, that all things are through him and for him, that he is the great I am and that his goals and his purposes will not be thwarted, that the enemy will not prevail. And as a result for followers of Christ, we're on the winning side. And yet, we need to remember that we have already won for all those who believe in him. So I want to spend the rest of our time just talking about the, this beautiful passage of um, Revelation 1, 1 through 20. And in particular, I want to talk about verses 12 and 13. And that really begins this vision of what John saw in this passage. And in verses 12 and 13, John turned and saw one like the Son of Man. That is describing Christ Jesus himself. In the the Hebraic, we would know that this is a way, the Son of Man is really a way of saying that he saw one that looked like a human being. And it becomes clear that John is referring to the same image that we see in Daniel 7, 13 and 14. That we see that he's referring to Christ Jesus, the one who is without time, the one who transcends time, the one who is before all things, and everything is through him and for him. 
And this refers to the central figure in all of history, the one who all the kingdoms of the world have been given. And when Tom or when John turns to see this voice, he saw the seven golden st lampstands, which John later learns represent the seven churches, the seven churches which we'll hear about in weeks two, three, and four of our series. So note that Christ is in the middle of the seven churches. He is in the midst of the seven churches. He lives and moves among his churches. So if you're involved in a New Testament church today, uh, even at AU, at Abernathy United, we know that Jesus is active in the churches and he is active through his spirit in moving and propelling things forward and convicting his people and leading his people. He is not absent. I want you to, to you and I to grasp us. He is present in the earthly church bodies of his people. Praise God, because without him, there is no redemption. Without him, there is no change. Without him, there is no transformation. Without him, there are no miracles. So praise God, he's in the midst of his churches. So then John goes on to describe this towering figure that he experiences and sees in his vision. And he reaches for all types of adjectives and words to convey the full reality of the one who transcends all words and all images. And the first thing that catches his attention is the way that Jesus is dressed, that he's wearing the robe of a priest, the robe of the high priest, like the one that Aaron would have worn. The glorified son of man is the great high priest. So in the text, we see that this word um, is really the word mediator. And this Latin for this word would be pontifex, and which really means bridge builder. Jesus is the ultimate mediator. He is the ultimate bridge builder. He is the pontifex. And that really means that he is the one that bridges the gap between God Almighty, who is perfect and holy, and sinful beings and creatures such as all of us. He bridges this infinite chasm between us and God, and he does so because he knows both sides of the chasm. He knows both sides of the, of the canyon because he is fully God and fully man. He walked as someone who um, experiences all the, the heartache and pain and suffering that you and I experience, yet he is fully God, fully without sin, holy and perfect. And because he knows what it's like to be human and what it's like to be God, he is the only one who could be the mediator. He is the only one who could wear this ultimate priestly robe. And the great thing is, is something I want you and I to really consider is that he's wearing a golden girdle across his breast as John describes. Now listen, this would normally be worn as a belt, not across his chest, but really across his waist. And that would indicate that he still has work to do. But notice that Christ, as John describes him, is not wearing it across this girdle, this uh, golden girdle across um, his waist, meaning that he has work to do. He's wearing it across his chest. And so he is resting in the accomplishment of a task that is already completed. You and I must grasp this, that the high priestly work of Jesus Christ is finished. It was finished on the cross. It is done. So he paid the price to bridge the gap between God and us. For all those who believe and accept him in faith, in faith alone and in Christ alone, then he alone has already paid the price for us to believe and to walk in relationship with him. That is great news. And that is part of this beautiful imagery. The last thing I really want to share with you today are the seven elements. Seven represents completion. And he, John, describes these seven elements that represent Christ as he sees him in this vision. The first is hair, white like wool, which represents not just wisdom, but the fact that he has forgiven all those who rely on him for forgiveness based on his death on the cross. It is a statement that nothing catches him by surprise. And then John sees eyes like a flame of fire. This means that Jesus is purifying in the way that he looks at us and is not only pure, but purifying. And the fire that comes from his eyes illuminates and burns away impurities. 
He cannot just look at us, but he can look through us to understand our very heart, our thoughts, our intentions, our desires. Third, he described Jesus as having feet like burnished bronze. And this would have had the, meant that they would have glown uh, um, in the furnace and they're not shaky or fragile. They can withstand all that the enemy has to throw at him. He has his stance and his footing is not shaky. It is sturdy and there is no end to his power. And there is no op opposition that can um, overcome him or burn away. So number four, his voice is right in the middle. And at the center of this image, his, in his voice, there is not just the creation that we find in the book of Genesis, but there's also power and justice. And then John describes his hand. And in his hand, he holds seven stars, which represent the seven messengers to the seven churches that we'll study in weeks two, three, and four. And that means that he controls the churches, that he controls its leaders. And because of that, in his churches, he is still leading and he is still active. The sixth thing that John describes to us is out of his mouth came a two-edged sword. His words cut through nonsense. His words cut through falsehoods. His words cut through deception. And his words have power. And then the final description that we get from John in this first passage of scripture is of his face, that his face was like the sun, so brilliant and so warm, and his, its radiance can only be compared to the sun. Wow, this is who John describes based on this text in uh, Revelation chapter 1. So let's look finally as we close today at how John responds. We see that John falls onto, uh, off of his feet and he falls like a dead man. And Jesus puts his right hand on John to try to encourage him not to be, have fear. Look at what he says. Look at what scripture says in verses 17 and 18 of Revelation chapter 1. Christ says, look, I have the keys. Jesus Christ has taken the chief weapon from the enemy. And the weapon behind all fear is the fear of death. He says, I have the keys to death. Look, I have them, Jesus says. I am alive and I have the key. He's really telling us, fear no more. Don't be afraid at what's to come. Don't be afraid of the unknown. Because I am sovereign. I have the keys to death and to Hades, and the thing that you fear the most, he has control over. And while we don't always understand death, we know to, that to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord, that if for a follower of Christ, we have nothing to fear, that things get better from us, for us from here, that once we go to be with the Lord, it is better than to be in the bodies we are in. The human tents, the skin tents that we were in, now, sometimes we think that this is the ultimate reality. It is not. And for followers of Christ, we have nothing to fear. So we should stop being afraid as Jesus reminds John and is also reminding us that he is with us in the midst of persecution and torment and trial and things that we don't understand. Jesus is saying to John, but also to you and I, I was dead, but look, I am alive forevermore and I hold the keys. I hold the keys to death. I hold the keys to life. And for all those who believe in me, they will have everlasting life. Listen, if you're not a follower of Christ, from this image, we see that for all those who believe, there's no reason to fear. That Jesus is with us now and he will be with us forevermore. And the things that we will learn about in the book, they are not for followers of Christ, meaning the tribulation, the end time events, the persecution, the death, they're not for those who believe. And yet Jesus will still be seeking to bring all those who are willing to him during the tribulation period, during um, all the turmoil, even during the millennial reign. He is proclaiming that all those who are willing would believe in him and have eternal life. If you're not a follower of Christ, 
The first step for you is to trust him in, in him as your Savior and Lord, realizing that you, like me, are a sinner in need of a Savior, that you're not perfect, that you can't follow all the rules and requirements of the Bible as Jesus did. He lived a perfect life. You and I do not and cannot of our own accord. So because of that, it requires that we rely on the death of the only one who lived a perfect life and died a horrible death to pay the price for your sin and for mine. It's by simple faith and trust in him and in belief in him that we have eternal life. Will you trust him today as your savior and your Lord? Will you decide to stop living for yourself as I once did and live for him? Will you put your faith in him? If you will, I pray that you would reach out to us. We'd love to pray with you and lead you into a relationship with Jesus Christ by simple faith and trust. You can reach out to me at 806-438-0089. I'd love to pray with you and lead you into your next step after following him of believer's baptism. So I'd love to talk to you more about that. Listen, if you're a follower of Christ, I want you to have faith and trust that he has already defeated the enemy, that he has done the, the completed work on the cross, and that everything that happens next in the end times is at his appointed time, that his goals and his plans will not be thwarted, that all of his purposes for believers in Christ will come to pass. And then also that there will ultimately be justice and equity. And while that's terrifying, if you're a non-believer, for those of us walking with Christ, we can have confidence in what he's doing and without justice and without judgment, he would not be holy. And so while it's difficult to understand it, um, we know that the main thing that he does is to seek mercy, to bring mercy and grace for all those who are willing to turn to him. Will you turn to him today? If you're an unbeliever, I pray that you will. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, I pray that through this series, you and I grow much more closely to him in transformation. So will you walk in a relationship that's only found in a personal and genuine relationship with Jesus Christ? I pray that until I see you the next time, that you and I will do that. And through that, we will find joy and peace that's only found in him. Until I see you next time, I love you. Look forward to seeing you soon.